So let's uh, move on now. Uh, we're going to get into the program, and it's called Blood and Fire, the Nourishment and Strength of Citizens of the Kingdom. And Father Jack is going to kick that off and tell us about that. Thank you, Father Jack. Good morning, everyone. And as we begin uh, today, what a great image. Uh, that's such a great, great workers, uh, Tim and Debbie working on that to get that beautiful image there. Because today we want to focus on two of our sacraments particularly, and on Christ in his flesh and blood, and, and the Holy Spirit and the power, the strength of confirmation, the nourishment and strength of the citizens of the kingdom. That's who we are, building that kingdom. And so, this is a great prayer, the Anima Christi. I love this particular translation, particularly the third line, inebriate me. I like that, spiritual inebriation, uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember on Pentecost Sunday, they go out and say, have you had wine? What's wrong with you? Why are you so motivated? You got this fire on top of your head, and you're proclaiming Christ. Uh, are you drunk? And they say, no. But what are they? They're, spilled, they're filled with the new wine. The wine of the Holy Spirit that cannot be placed in the old wine skins of the old covenant, but that are expanded and the new wine needs to be placed in those whose uh, skin is now the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, a uh, new creation, a new way of living. So let's pray this beautiful prayer together. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. This is a great prayer to pray after Mass. We have a translation of this uh, inside of our hymnal at the church. So after Mass, you may wish to open that up and to pray this prayer because this is a prayer that I sometimes pray. When I come back after Mass, I go to the vestry after I've greeted people and I say some prayers as I appropriate the gift of the Blessed Sacrament. So I encourage you to do so also. Together we say, Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Separated from thee, let me never be. From the malignant enemy, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me. To come to thee, bid me. That I may praise thee in the company of thy saints for all eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's beautiful. It's beautifully written, very poetically written. There's some inversion in it. If you read through it, meditate on it, you'll, get all the, you'll understand all that's being said there. But it's, it's very beautifully written. Um, so here we are, living between defeat and victory, heaven and hell. Right now we're at a midpoint. Christ has come, and he has indeed redeemed us. However, he will not save us without our cooperation. He's not going to take us to heaven kicking and screaming. So we have to cooperate with the gift of grace. So we're between the fall uh, and the eschaton. We live in a time of redemption, right? So Christ, though he gives us grace, does not take away concupiscence. We still have a draw to sin. He wants us, what is it? If you are to lift weights, you press against that weight, and that resistance creates strength, okay? What God says is, I'm going to take the consequence of your fall and your struggle is going to make you strong. He's going to take the fact that we are wounded, but the struggle to overcome that wound will strengthen us. That what we endure that's very painful makes us better. As we say in sports, no pain, no gain. In the spiritual life, that's more true. It's very true that those who are most advanced spiritually have suffered the most. It's as simple as that. If you have somebody who knows how to embrace suffering, remain faithful, hopeful, and charitable in the midst of it, they're the holy ones. There's nobody else who's a canonized saint who has not gotten there by way of the cross. And so seriously, when you're, if you want to find out if somebody's spiritually mature, one of the things you want to look for is have they embraced the suffering of their life or have they run away from it? You know, Christ is not some kind of... Uh, you know, Ursat's life coach. He's our crucified Savior and Lord who entered deeply into the present situations as they are, okay? 
He didn't tell people how to cope with life. He told people how to enter deeply into the abundant richness of life. Okay? He's not about just managing things. He's about the straight and narrow way. So we have to remember Christ is telling us to live with intensity and deep devotion in the present moment and letting the future come to us. Okay? And, and letting mystery unfold, that we can't define things. We can't control things. We have to give everything over to God in total surrender so that his will be revealed in a mystery that unfolds before us. Uh, so we have to have this sense of wonder. It's so important. So here we are between the defeat and victory, between heaven and hell, so the Garden of either Eden. I want to make a contrast be here between the garden in which we originally were set and the Teneculum or the upper room in Calvary. There's a movement upward from the garden. From the garden, we're moving upward. We're moving from the garden to the heavenly Jerusalem, okay? And so Christ is lifted up on the cross. Christ is lifted up at the Last Supper. Christ is lifted up on the third day. Christ is lifted up in the ascension. We're moving along a way, and the way is up and onward, okay? And so we can see this movement. We move from the garden where we fell before the father of lies and a murderer who is Satan and the father of truth and love. We move from the tree of disobedience and death to the tree of obedience and life. We move from the first Adam. We're all brothers and sisters. We all bleed red, okay? But in the blood of the last Adam, Jesus, we're all going to bleed in a new life and a new creation in him. So we move between the first Adam of sin and the last Adam of obedience, Christ our Savior. We move from the first Eve who was drawn into sin and ate the forbidden fruit to the new Eve Mary who bears uh, from her womb the fruit from the saving tree of the cross. We move from forbidden fruit to the fruit of Mary's womb. We move from loss of grace to fullness of grace, beginning with Mary, right? Hail Mary, full of grace. So what it is is we're between those two realities, okay? And we do have a mother. We have a mother Eve. You know, whenever I teach kids and there's a great diversity in their complexions, I always say, hey, we're all related. And they go, what? They go, oh, yeah, we have the same first parents. Uh, Adam and Eve, I'm related to you. This is a, the, my tribe went off to Ireland for a while, and they got, got really pale. You know, your tribe went off for a while, went to Africa. They got really dark, but we're all from the same parents, right? We're all from the same parents. And, and really, when you look at the essentials of humanity, as I've traveled, I find it breaks down to the same things. It breaks down to personal integrity, dignity. Do we have a good mother and father? Do we have good family life? It's all the same. Every problem we have goes back to the very root problems of Adam and Eve and family life, right? It's all the same things. And so that's how we, this is the great thing about being Catholic, is we know that through Christ, we perceive people through Christ, not through a political prism, not through an economic prism, not through anything except for Christ himself, who unites everybody in his blood, because the blood is the same color for anybody, no matter who they are. This is our Christ. This is our Savior. And so here we are, living between defeat and victory, heaven and hell continued. Those fallen in defeat are lifted up in victory. Yes, we have fallen, but God came to earth. He came from the heights of heaven to the depths of earth, even into the depths of hell, to harrow hell. He came as deep as you possibly could come, entering into the tomb, entering into death, harrowing hell on Holy Saturday. And so what we see is those fallen into defeat are lifted up in victory. And there's three gifts for the victors. We need to remember the gifts of God that he has given to us. We need to remember the big three. Okay, You'll, this homily this weekend emphasizes the number three. You'll see I've been meditating on this a lot. But really it boils down to this, doesn't it? that we are, we are going to have victory in Christ Jesus' victory, the sacred heart, the body and blood of Christ. This is the blood. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Even if I talk to a Baptist, we'll always say we're saved in the blood of the Lamb, right? Because I remember one time there was a, a Baptist one of our funerals, and I talked about the blood of the Lamb. And I said, well, you know, that's, we believe that that's actually present here. Uh, in, the, in the Eucharist, but that's how we're saved. We're washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, saved in the blood of the Lamb. The Immaculate Heart, where did the Christ get that blood? He got that blood from the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the sinless heart, the ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God. So the Immaculate Heart, Mary, behold your mother. Christ uh, at the Last Supper is lifted up, on the cross is lifted up, and in that supper and sacrifice gives us his flesh, gives us his blood, okay? But also... At the cross, Christ gives us his mother. And so we as beloved disciples behold our mother, realizing that 
Christ got his very flesh and blood from her. That there's a reversal at the tree. The tree, you had Adam and Eve. Now at the tree of the cross, you have the new Eve and the last Adam. Okay? And instead of uh, this fruit that we had in the garden, now we realize the fruit of the tree of life is Christ himself, the very flesh and blood that is given to us. And then, of course, the fire of the Holy Spirit. That God wants us to be one body, one spirit in Christ. That the birthday of the church is celebrated both from the side of Christ from which comes the water of our rebirth and baptism and the blood of the Eucharist that nourishes that, but also at Pentecost when the church is born in the sense of its missionary mandate. So your personal sanctification is born from the cross where you're washed clean in the blood and water of the Lamb, but your missionary birth is taking place at Pentecost where the Spirit energizes that so you go forward, right? Okay, so... So there's, there's a double birth that we talk about, just like the breathing of the Holy Spirit. There's, a, there's kind of a, a double Pentecost in that Christ breathes the gift and power to bind and loose sins when he rises upon his disciples, but also not just the breath, which is the Spirit of God, but also the fire, which is the Spirit of God. So he breathes sanctification, but he also sends fire for missionary evangelization. Those two things can never be separated. Your sanctification is dependent on evangelization. Your evangelization's effectiveness is based on your sanctification. You can't separate those two things. Personal sanctification and mission are of one heart. And we need to remember that. And so the fire of the Holy Spirit, they will be, are, we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that happening. So here we go. We live nourished in the blood of the Lamb. Do you realize... That Christ's crucifixion, his being bound, and so forth, what they do with lambs actually in the Middle East is very much what they did with the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That much of what happens in a crucifixion is what happens when they actually butcher lambs. Okay, so if you actually see a butchering of a lamb uh, in the Holy Land, you're going to see something that very much shows us the butchering of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so what do we see? The blood of the Lamb... In other words, Christ, the Last Supper, gives his body and blood. How do we have a sacrifice? The body and the blood must separate. That's why at Mass, there's a double consecration. Why is it the priest just doesn't consecrate the body? Because we know in the body is the body, blood, soul, and divinity. We know in the blood is the body, blood, soul, and divinity. Why is there a double consecration in the two signs? Because there's a sacrifice, not just a supper. So the priest first consecrates the bread. Then... And he lifts it up and he adores it. And he consecrates, excuse me, consecrates the wine. And then he, why is it double? Because the body and blood are separated in a sacrifice. That's the purpose of it. The purpose of that sign is that there is a sacrifice. And it's not just a supper, but a sacrifice. Okay? It's on an altar, but also a table. It combines both the upper room and the cross. Okay, so all these images come together because God's smarter than we are. He can do these things. And so he comes. I love this. Because Christ is priest and victim. He is shepherd and lamb. He is king and servant. You see how he transforms every role that we think would be lording power over another. What's the basic problem? That Adam is lording his strength over the weaker one, the vulnerable one, the one who bears children, the one who is physically not as strong. It's not what his strength is for. His strength is to serve the person who bears children, to take care of the child, not to lord over the vulnerable individual. Remember, vulnerability in our estimation is a sign of less power, whereas we realize that vulnerability through Mary reveals greater power. The vulnerability of Mary makes for the one human person a female through whom God comes into the world through her vulnerability and her humility. And she's contradicting the pride of the male. Contradicting it. Okay? So, here we go. Priest and victim, Christ offers and is offered. The slain lamb, the loving sacrifice, the acceptable gift to the Father, the saving gift for us. We have an exodus. The exodus from the old covenant, which is a Passover, to the new covenant, which is the Eucharist. We are leaving Egypt, we are leaving sin to journey no longer to the Holy Land, but to journey to the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, so there's a new exodus in the new covenant 
that was foreshadowed very clearly in the Old Covenant. Okay, so here we go. Love nourished in the blood of Christ. Blood saves and gives. Now, just think of blood practically speaking. You know, you go in and, and you're, you've been bleeding profusely. You need an infusion of blood to live. You lose your blood, you die. It's very simple. Blood saves and gives life. Blood purifies. Okay, when you go to the doctor and you get this good blood, it purifies you from the tainted uh, uh, disease blood that you have sustains and strengthens, comes from love and returns to love. Think about it. Blood's in your heart. Goes from your heart, comes back to your heart. Okay? If you see this as an image of the Holy Spirit, the Father to the Son, the Son to the Father. If you see what it's all about, it's all about the origin of everything is love, the end of everything is love. Okay? So when you, when you see blood circulating through your body, you just realize, well, that's kind of the summation of all things. I will be done. God's will is equal to God's love, okay? Everything originates from love and returns to it and is poured out, Life's Christ's life, our life. In the end, we go, well, this is great. It's nice to have self-love, uh, to be loving self, but I've got to pour out my love. It's got to be, overwhel- it's got to be overflowing. So God himself, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, but then they pour out that Holy Spirit upon us, Okay? So we move from love of self, which is appropriate, which is saying I love myself enough to become holy and good, to love of others, which is pouring out this goodness that we have received by God, okay? We become instruments of grace. Love ultimately wants to be diffuse. Love ultimately wants to go outward and not remain in. It's by its nature not meant to be isolated and alienated. So love nourished in the blood of Christ, piercing wounds of love, passion and and compassion. Remember, we have the passion of Christ, the compassion of Mary. Jesus, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. God's response, by him becoming so humble, by him becoming weak, he responds by giving more. He gives from the very heart. So the more we oppose him in hate, the more he gives in love. So he goes to death, he goes to torture, he goes to suffering, And what does he do? He just gives. Father, forgive them. He says verbally. Then, if you think about it, the mass is the word. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. First thing. Then the word is made flesh. His heart is pierced. From his side comes blood and water. Word, word made flesh. You see how it works? Everything in, when you get married, word. You exchange vows. Then you have your relations with each other. Word made flesh. Everything is word made flesh. Everything is word made flesh. This is what God has revealed because the word has been made flesh. And we're going to allow that word, that gospel message, the beginning of the mass, made flesh in the Eucharist. You receive that and you take that gospel word out. Everything is word. Everything is sacrament. Everything is word made flesh. This is revealed through Christ again. Mary, a sword will pierce your heart. A double piercing. Hers by compassion. His by passion. His in the bodies. Her in the soul. A sword will pierce through your soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. How do we know the thoughts of hearts through the heart of Mary? Okay? And the hearts are revealed, a lot of your, basically an attitude towards Mary, and an understanding of Christ through Mary, reveals the heart of any individual. Okay? It's a very very simple thing. Christians, by grace in the waters of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist, our hearts are united to the piercing of the sacred heart and of the immaculate heart. These two hearts are one, Sorrow and joy are woven into one true and sacrificial love. Joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a thread of silver twine. It is right, it should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. William Blake. Learned it when I was teaching eighth graders. Joy and sorrow. If you love, you're going to have joy and sorrow. And you need to go deep into sorrow And high into joy. You need to have both. If you're not joyful and sorrowful in a deep and rich way, get a life. You're avoiding life. I'm serious. What happens when you avoid sorrow? You're going to not have joy. What happens if you uh, avoid joy? You're just going to get depressed. The point is for us, we enter deeply into both of those. And we know that when we're at the height of joy, we're going to have some deep sorrow. And when we know we're at deep sorrow, we're going to have some high joy. Those are going to happen. Period. God has not revealed anything else. Mary is the cause of our joy and our lady of sorrows. She's revealed this, and so is Christ. 
Christ is both joy and sorrow. That is woven into one love. Every saint says it. Okay, every saint says it. Both of these are together, and you can't distinguish between the two. You'll find that when you love deeply, your sorrow and joy are always together, very close together. So here we go. Love confirmed in the fire of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the reversal of the dispersion of Babel where they went around not knowing each other, speaking in different words. Now they come together and understand each other in the word made flesh. Aspects of the fire, warmth of love, raging holy desire. You need to desire heaven more. You need to desire justice more. You need to desire mercy more. You should be really on fire inside saying like, man, I'm on fire. I got to get some of this fire out. Okay, that's holy desire God has to increase that in our hearts. Why does he hold, withhold things from us so desire increases? You know, you think about it. If, if, you wanted, if, you, if I wanted to date somebody when I was younger and she resists, what does it do? Increase desire, okay? If she's playing hard to get, I'm increasing that desire to get her. God does the same thing. He, he's smart in terms of holy romance. Purging and refining what is precious, like gold, dispelling darkness of fear, trials and tribulations. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials. I'm looking in this room, I've seen most of you, yes, you are suffering various trials. So that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What he has gone through, we will go through. Love confirmed in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Purified heart, a heart on fire with God's holy love, having purified your souls by your obedience to truth for a sincere love of the brethren. Love one another earnestly from the heart. There you go. Now we're moving on. Did you see that? Perfect timing. It's awesome. Here we go. We have our questions coming up. The blood and the fire. That's what we're living in, brothers and sisters. It's awesome. And today when you receive that Eucharist, and those of you who have been confirmed, let that Eucharist nourish your baptism and confirmation so that you not only are sanctified, but you are evangelizing in power. All right. Thank you, Father Jack. Good stuff. We're on fire. (laughs) Okay. um, If you're new to Ablaze, we typically right now we do what's called table talk. So we get to kind of internalize what we've heard. Um, So amongst your tables, you'll be able to converse with a couple of these questions. Um, the first question is, first question, what are the common piercings of our hearts that reveal the truth about our hearts and serve as opportunities for loving union with the sacred heart and immaculate heart? So let's take about five minutes for that question, and then we'll come back with another one. The next question is, what does the gospel encourage us to do to ignite the the fire of holy desire within our hearts and sustain, even increase, its intensity? What What does the gospel encourage us to do to ignite the fire of holy desire within our hearts and sustain or increase its intensity? Let's take five minutes for that question, and then we'll wrap up. going. Keep that conversation in your families and uh, in your workplace. It's good stuff. Um, Catch everybody up. We always do a send-off, so Father Jack is going to pray us home or pray us away or pray us to come back um, when we finish up, kind of wrap up the program. Just a couple of quick announcements. Again, remember, if you miss any of Blaze, these are recorded. Um, If you're not getting the uh, reminders, there's a little sign-up sheet in the back there. We do have some of our prayer journals. If you don't have your Blaze journal, it's a good idea to journal. Um, so remember that. 
Uh, bring your friends back. So we're going to do our three-week program. So next week we'll have Praxis, how to bring this information into your life very practically. And then we'll have a witness talk, and then we'll have three weeks off. So it'll be great. Um, do support our men's club. Uh, we do have uh, baskets in the outs- on the way out. You can make a donation to help cover the cost of the food. If there's any overages, it goes to our uh, ministry work that they do. And our youth group is around in all the church. Um, they'll be in and out of the exits uh, as you go in and out of Mass. They're trying to raise funds for St. Vincent de Paul. There's a lot of poor people out with suffering, um, you know, pierced hearts in our own community. So, so make sure you help out with that. Um, we also have um, Mr. Mark Baker, actually, is, um, it's kind of a banner day for him. It's a banner birthday for him, so we're excited about that. So we'll do uh, the last verse, happy birthday to you. There we go. And Mark is on our Blaze team. We've got a lot of folks behind the scenes. Um, hopefully Steve Malone did a pretty good job or an excellent job last week when I wasn't here. I really appreciate these guys helping out. Thanks, Steve. I heard good things. So that's all good. So uh, we'll see everybody next week, but Father Jack's going to give us a send-off. Thanks, Father Jack. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, what up? Now, the one thing, you know, sometimes when teachers ask questions, they're looking for a specific answer. On the second one, I was really hoping you would see that there's a very specific action that takes place before the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. And that specific action is that the apostles, as sons of Mary, go to the same upper room where Christ gave his flesh and blood, and they pray for nine days before the Holy Spirit comes with Mary. And so, for example, I, Mary, mother of the Eucharist, child, I didn't like accidentally name that, like, oh, that'd be a sweet kind of name. I named that specifically to say, you as a Christian... Never pray without the Mother Mary. That's a non-option for you. It, that's, don't do it. Uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm present also. So one way to make it very simple is every time you pray, make sure Mother Mary's with you. Now I advise you also to have Joseph with you and all the angels and saints, patriarchs and prophets. But, but I, what I'm saying is truly a Christian never prays alone. We believe in the communion of saints. We believe that we are united in a communion that does not require actual physical presence for that union because the Spirit unites us, okay? So it's very important for us to remember that. And so that's something I try to emphasize is that upper room. Remember, the upper room of the Last Supper is the upper room of Pentecost. Those are the same places. The first time when we go up there, that gift of Christ himself. The second time we go up there, the gift of Mary, my mother, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the three gifts. You see what I'm saying? Okay. It really pairs down to that fundamental reality of how we're getting to God our Father by the three gifts. Two of them uh, divine persons, one of them the only perfect human person. Does that make sense? If you, if you really pare down Christianity, that's pretty much, pretty much what it's about. That's how we're getting back. Okay, so... Let me see here. Little clicker here. Let me see. Out here. Whoops. Here we go. Morning prayer, Anima Christi. You can say the Latin if you want to. Anima Christi, Sanctifica me, Corpus Christi, Salva me. It's beautiful. And actually, the rhythm is absolutely lovely. And it's very simple to actually know the English from the Latin. So if you really wanted to start with something to give you Latin confidence, pray the Anima Christi because you really can understand all of it almost, just even just reading through it. And there's a beautiful rhythm to it. So. That's a prayer that, and actually, it's easy to memorize because of the beautiful rhythm of it. Uh, Mental prayer, got to stick to that because, remember, we need to have vision, and from vision, action needs to come. We need to constantly have gospel vision so that the gospel message is taken out, okay? And and believe me, it's a fight to get gospel vision. Uh, You know, this Lent, for example, uh, I just... The Lord was saying, just stop watching all television. Don't look at any media. Don't even listen to the radio. And I start realizing, like, man, I don't realize how much I don't see because I'm watching stuff. You don't realize what you're not seeing until you take away what you're looking at all the time. So we need to really refine our media use. And I would say do it radically. I'm serious. You need to do it radically. The thing that you 
have difficulty not saying, just, I just have to do it. Get rid of that thing particularly. Root that out. What that, what's that doing is it's blinding you to responsibility and it's blinding you to service. Okay? And that's the devil wants to numb us by getting us living in a virtual world, not a real world. And the devil wants to get adults. He wants everyone to be living in this virtual world where you actually never see the person you're talking to. Okay? The devil wants to do that. And right now, he is doing that. And I know it from personal experience. So what I'm saying to you is this. You need to emphasize the person in front of you. And you need to put away the electronic device where you can't see the face of the person. Okay? You need to emphasize that. During the day, when did I actually address the person that was right in front of me? Because that's the one God put in front of me. Okay? Okay? He didn't like say, here, I'm going to put an electronic device in front of you. He didn't say, I'm going to put a, a book in front of you. He says, I'm personal. He's revealed, I'm God and I'm personal. Right? I mean, it, it, basically, what, what, what Christianity is about is, I'm God and I'm personal. <laughs> I'm Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you need to be personal. Okay? It's not abstraction. It's not what's virtual. It is what is real, visible, and Invisible. We have to get grounded in that. Here we go. Examination of conscience followed by act of contrition. When my heart was pierced with sorrow, and it will be every day, did I withdraw into my own sadness or instead unite my suffering to the pierced immaculate heart and sacred heart, pouring out mercy and kindness upon others who suffer and even upon enemies who may have caused the sorrow? Is my heart of flesh to be pierced or is it a hard heart? that just backs away in fear and alienation, okay? Your heart is meant to remain flesh, and it's meant to be pierced in union with Christ because of the fallenness of the world. And this, this first question, actually, if you just did this at an examination of your conscience every day, that would be sufficient. Secondly, this day, when did I open and pour out love for my heart in tenderness and mercy? And when did I close and harden my heart in fear, anger, or lust? You know, when I read these questions, it's like, where did they come from? <laughs> I like to think they didn't come from me. C, did trials today enlighten my mind and purify my heart or darken my intellect and poison my heart? And D, today was I refined by holy desire or dirtied by impure desires? Okay? Uh, this really applies to men. Okay, we're going to have a battle-ready retreat coming up soon. This, kind of, this is the kind of examination of conscience. We, because who is Christ calling us? Who's the one calling to lead? He's call, he says, I want to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers. Why? Because mothers' hearts are already there. It's the fathers who have failed to protect the women, the fathers who have failed to protect the children, the fathers who have abandoned their wives to the devil. The fathers who have gone to the devil themselves. Because when you look at the, the curse that's given to the devil, it's attacking who? The woman, not the man. When you look at the curse given to the woman, she has two curses. One is that she's going to have difficulty childbearing and she's still going to long for men, even though they're total train wrecks and dumpster fires. And th third, that the man's going to go to work and when he works, he's going to really hate it because he's going to be in thorns and thistles. And he'll bring it home and bring it upon his wife and children. That's what he does. So the woman is caught in the middle of every single difficulty. Childbearing, child rearing, abuse from spouse, abuse from the devil. And the men are the ones who just step up and protect her, not be quiet like, like Adam was at the original. Not be quiet, but stand up, speak out, defend, protect, and nurture the child. Nurture and love the wife. Because she's the vulnerable one and Christ came as the vulnerable one. Does that make sense? It's really about men stepping up. It's about men stepping up. This is what women want from men. Men stepping up and doing their job. So this right here. This right here is primarily directed to you of you men. And don't tell me you're a woman. You are a man. I can observe it. Okay? 
But you understand uh, what I'm saying? You need to step up and you need to, f- to defend and protect and love your spouse and defend and protect and love your children. Let us all stand, please. As we turn to the mother of God, the only sinless human person ever in the history of mankind. And so we turn to her in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. All right. Thank you, Father Jack. All right. Hopefully we can listen to a Blaze radio if we turn off all other